All right, everybody, welcome back. Um, this is at least for the 2019-2020 school year that turned out to be less than ideal because of COVID-19. This is the last video that I will be posting. And basically the conclusion of the class, if you've hung out, if you've hung around this whole time to see how the story ends, um, RA level class from the beginning of the year, until now, this is this is how it ends. Next year, I'm going to have to go further into the 90s. All right. So there's a bunch of videos online that talk about this topic, the fall of communism. Or if you want to be more specific, the fall of, you know, that version that was, you know, initiated by the, would become the Soviet Union in 1917 and now extended itself into Eastern Europe, et cetera, et cetera. Um, how that ceased to be, how that came to an end uh, between 1917 and, and, and 1991. And, and so, yes, absolutely, that's what we're going to focus on now. Causes. Truth of it, you know, I have to try to get this under an hour. And we have a lot of um, facts to go over. Causes, there's a million videos that go over causes. Were there systemic problems? Yes. Were there structural problems? Yes. Um... But the truth can be said about, you know, just about any country. But, you know, it had its own particular structural, systemic, institutional problems because of that particular um, model of government based on that particular interpretation of, of Marxist um, theory, um, which was founded by Vladimir Lenin in 1917. And, um, yes, that did come to an end, okay? Um, if there's going to be any editorial, editorializing for me, it might be to address some nonsense myths that in our hubris in the 1990s we tried to um, promote. Um, but this is pretty much just going to be about sequence of events. Sequence of events um, more than actual causes. I mean, causes, if we live in class, we could discuss causes. This is more about sequence of events, chronological, historical, historical what brought about the end of the Soviet Union and uh, the Warsaw Pact slash social, uh, social Eastern Bloc. All right. So let's remind ourselves, what was the Soviet Union? No, it was not Russia. At least it wasn't Russia alone. The Soviet Union was exactly that, a union, a union of 15 republics. The Russian Soviet Socialist Republic the Kazakh Soviet Socialist Republic, the Georgian Soviet Socialist Republic, the Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic, okay? 15 republics in one union. So it had, at least as a facade, a federal model, much like we have in the United States. You had the national government, which was the government of the union, of the Soviet Union. And then you had the republic governments, the governments that represent what we would call states, the governments that existed in every one of the republics. In practice, everything gravitated around Moscow and around Russia. But on paper, it was a union of 15 republics. Okay, There was the national government, and then each republic had its own government. Were they all Russians? No. The Soviet Union was made up of hundreds of different ethnicities recognize that these 15 official languages but the truth is 70 percent of the population was slavic european slavic okay so we're just bringing that up to address you know the the diversity of the, the richness the complexity that was the soviet union um and then after world war ii we have to add to that what will one day become the eastern bloc okay you understand the character of every one of these countries. They were not member states of the Soviet Union. Okay. Poland <clears throat> was Poland. Czechoslovakia, well, Czech, well before they, Czechoslovakia was Czechoslovakia, Romania was Romania, Hungary was Hungary. They were client states, satellite states, whatever you want to call them of the Soviet Union. But the government was made up of Poles, of Germans, of Czechoslovakians, of Hungarians, Romanians. What did they have in common? It was a government of Marxist-Leninist character that was allied with Moscow and the Soviet Union during the Cold War. How did that come to be? Because when these countries were occupied by the Nazis, 
it was the Red Army that came and drove the Nazis out. And this is how Europe was split. Agreement between Great Britain, the United States, and the Soviet Union. This is how Europe was split. Who gets what? And then, of course, Germany, the eastern portion of Germany. You know, you have Germans. Germans that are Marxist-Leninist. Germans that take their chunk of German and side it with Germany and side it with Moscow during the Cold War, but Germans nonetheless. But they were not member states of the Soviet Union. And, and yes, as much influence the Soviet Union, Moscow had over these republics, it was not 100%. Okay? Each one of them did have their own unique characteristics and policies that although they could spin them as Marxist Leninists, that did exist. So I'm going to start probably in the oddest of places that I doubt that if <clears throat> you look up uh, a video on this topic, this is where they're going to start. But this is where I'm going to start. We're going to look at where the cracks begin to, and the cracks were long, you know, long established, okay? When, when, when that's your metric, when you're looking at you know, uh, quality of life, standard of living as per Western metrics, uh, diet, you know, calories, access to consumer goods. When you're looking at those things, yes, the second world fell behind. Remember, when, when the Soviet Union fell, it was the second largest economy in the world. But even that, Okay, it was not even half the size of the American economy. Okay, I mean, there's lots of reasons, but we're not going to go into the reasons, however tempting it may be. I'm going to start with the appointment of Pope John Paul II as the new Pope, October 16th, 1978. And why do I start with him? Because after nearly 2,000 years of almost exclusive Italian popes, the Vatican decides to name a Pole. And this Polish Pope is not going to see himself as outside and above the fray of politics, but is very much going to involve himself in politics. Very much so in the Cold War politics of his era. If we're looking for the weakest link, let's go where the weakest link is going to be, where the cracks, the most obvious of cracks, are going to begin to emerge in Poland. Despite um, having a Marxist-Leninist government since the mid-40s, um, very Catholic population, and the government of Poland acquiesced to an official visit from the Pope. A fellow Pole, understand how powerful this is. Thousands and thousands and thousands of Catholic Poles went to go see Pope John Paul II, a fellow Pole. And using the office of the Vatican, he could get away with saying stuff that neither of them couldn't say. And he basically tells them, don't be afraid. And it's a very simple message, but it resonates with incredible consequences after that. And this is June 1979. Doesn't take long. It's interesting how in, 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 the, in, in these particular systems that are dedicated to the working people, the dictatorship of the proletariat, um, one of the first things, not to fade away completely, they're not Nazis, but labor unions end up transforming themselves into organizations that are no longer labor unions um, by the Western definition of the word. Because if a labor union's purpose is to organize and be antagonistic towards the employer, Okay, and antagonize the employer into acquiescing to better pay and better conditions. What happens when the employer is the state and is the only employer? There was a labor union in Poland, 
but it was an extension of the state. It was not an independent labor union. There's labor unions in every one of these countries, but they're not independent of the state. So how can you navigate on behalf of the workers, but not against the interests of the state? Lake Walesa, I'm going to have trouble with the Polish names, in the Gdansk shipyards, that's one of the little bit of coastline that Poland had, organizes an independent labor union of shipyard, shipyard workers. First ever independent of the government labor union in the Eastern Bloc. Um, and what do you do with this guy? Because you can't say that he's bourgeois, that he's pro-West, because he's telling you he's pro-labor, he's pro-worker, but at the same time, he doesn't feel that the state-owned and operated labor union is really in the position to argue on behalf of the demands of the workers. And, and they're demanding better pay and better conditions. They're not demanding a change of government. Eventually, it comes to that. When you ask, you know, years later, you ask Lake Walesa, was that what you were after? He said, no, that's not what we were after. That's not the intent, at least not in the beginning. Solidarity is the name of this movement, of this independent labor organization. And they emerged just a couple of months after the Pope's, you know, that's why I put the Pope. There's a couple of months after the Pope's visit, you know, this, this independent labor union emerges and, and the government doesn't know what to do with it until eventually um, it decides that it doesn't want to deal with it. It decides that it can say it's pro-worker all it wants, but it's a threat to the state. And Poland is put under martial law. Um, <clears throat> by the general, I'm not even going to attempt to pronounce his name, you can see there in the PowerPoint. And martial law lasts for a little over two years. <clears throat> Until changes start happening in the Soviet Union. In that interim period, while there is martial law in Poland and solidarity is banned, Brezhnev, a conservative, in, in Soviet political circles, dies. The rest of, you know, the carousel of uh, <clears throat> geriatric uh, Soviet rulers, everybody from the same generation, Yuri Andropov emerges, but he succumbs to an illness not long after. Um, Konstantin Chernenko, same thing. So for a couple of years there, the Soviet Union is dealing with, um, they had never done this before. It's because of the age group they're getting these guys from. Um, <clears throat> these are, most of these guys are World War II veterans, if not, you know, lived before the Soviet Revolution, at least as children. So eventually, this is when history starts to change. In 1985, they pick a younger man, a man that was a product of the revolution, born in the revolution, Mikhail Gorbachev emerges, ascends to being the top dog in the Soviet Union. Now, remember what I've told you about the structure of the Soviet Union. They had branches, okay, if you want to call them that, okay. They, they had elections. They were indirect elections, but they, they were not like ours. They had a legislative branch, the Supreme Soviet, which they renamed later on. Um, they had an executive branch, which was not elected by the people, it was elected by the Supreme Soviet. And then they had this fourth branch that probably had more power than the other branches, the party itself. Gorbachev emerges as general secretary of the party in 1985 and keeps that position until 91. He becomes chairman of the Supreme Soviet in 89. Keeps it until 90. While chairman of the Supreme Soviet, See, these, these, these particular systems allow for somebody to wear multiple hats. Chairman of the Presidium of the Supreme Soviet. The Presidium is that select group of individuals elected by the Supreme Soviet to function as the executive branch of the government. But that particular group of people also competes with the Central Committee of the, the Politburo of the party. And it's usually the same people. And then after there was a restructuring, he's actually president of the USSR. The first time they adopt that title from 1990 to 1991. But in the Soviet Union, like in all these countries, the most lucrative and powerful position 
is the general secretary of the party, who almost always is also, you know, the, the chairman of, you know, that central committee that functions as its chief executive. Now, I want you to think back on Reagan. Reagan's first four years, he's the hawk. Second four years is when Gorbachev comes in. And Gorbachev is a reformer. A younger generation, he's a reformer. In fact, by the, nine, by, the, by the time 1985 comes around, you already have a number of reformers in key positions in the Soviet government. Okay? People that are open and willing okay, to experiment with market reforms. And then all of a sudden, we see Reagan become the diplomat, the peacemaker. But only after Gorbachev entered the Kremlin. Two key reforms that Gorbachev tried to implement, perestroika and glasnost. One economic, one political. Perestroika was basically a restructuring of the economy. Implement elements of a free market economy and over to save the overall centrally planned economy of the Soviet Union. Allow for small businesses, allow for cooperatives, allow for, for joint ventures and foreign investment. This is how McDonald's gets into the Soviet Union. This is how Pepsi gets into the Soviet Union. Okay? The idea that the capital infusion that could come from opening up to some market reforms would be enough to prop up the state enterprises that were failing. And then Glasnost was the political element. A greater willingness to be open within Soviet society. An encouragement of, of, of discussion, of debate, without fear of reprisal. So Gorbachev's government is going to back off more than any Soviet government before of the press and of artists and of dissidents and, criti and critics. Streamline the government, make government smaller. So I guess somebody in the Soviet government was listening to Gorbachev. Open criticism of the party and of central planning. And then eventually this is gonna move towards multi-candidate multi elections and the Soviet com uh, Communist Party, the Soviet Union, no longer enjoying the unquestioned um, dominance over. We understand Gorbachev is a socialist. He still is to this day. Gorbachev was hoping that by tweaking here and there, he could solve the overall thing. Kind of like an FDR. But forces of history were not going to allow this to happen okay and his reforms are going to open up a Pandora's box in which everything is going to be swept into if you ask anybody what what was the defining moment that marked the beginning of the end it was the Chernobyl disaster of April 16th 1986 HBO did a great series on it I suggest uh, you check it out. I'm not going to get into the scientific details. Chernobyl was a town some distance. It was, it was a special town. It was a town that not everybody could live in. It was created for the sole purpose of providing housing to um, the employees at that nuclear power plant. Um, it was some distance from Kiev. It was in Ukraine. And long story short, um, one of the reactor cores exploded. Meltdown is eh, not quite what happened. It exploded and released a substantial amount of radiation, not just to the nearby vicinity, but threatened to sweep that, that, that radiation threatened to go contaminate much of Central Europe. Um, you should watch the series. Um, this highlighted many of the deficiencies and shortages of the Soviet Union. That the reason why that plant had that accident 
was because of the many shortcuts that they had to take because they did not necessarily have access to technology from the West and, and, and superior materials that could have very much um, and, and the cost okay the involved in, in making this plant more secure and and many claim this is what this is what started it this is this is what began that change yeah the Pope okay political um, but they actually showed you know the dire circumstances that the Soviet Union was in economically what was the because remember they were very good at, at hiding just how bad things were then comes 1989 very very consequential year George Herbert Walker Bush former CIA officer former CIA director very involved in Bay of Pigs and, and Nixon's White House and of course he was Reagan's vice president um, <clears throat> he becomes president pretty much riding on the coattails of Ronald Reagan um, you know, his presidency is one that I would know as, as a young man and the consequences of them. You know, he is going to be the one that it's going to be in the White House when the Soviet Union and, and the Eastern Bloc collapses. So a lot of people have this myth that it was Reagan. No, it wasn't Reagan. Reagan was gone. And we're going to, you know, I'm, I'm, I wasn't going to editorial about causes, but if there's any myth that needs to be addressed is the Reagan myth to all of this. So we're getting to mid-June and it's not in Russia or in the Eastern Bloc that we see something of circumstance, uh, 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 of consequence happens. It's, it's in China. Now remember when Nixon went to China and he visited Mao Zedong and from that point forward China, even before, where do you think Gorbachev got the idea from? China started to implement very serious reforms and changes to their government. Deng Xiaoping spun it as saying we're we're, we're gonna we're gonna keep China uh, communism but with Chinese characteristics. Okay. In other words, figure out a way for the party to stay in power. Okay and grow the economy as well adopting many free market practices now a lot of people don't quite get Tiananmen right okay they, there's a tendency to make this narrative that this was an overall this was a revolt of the young people of China against communism and etc cetera, etc cetera. no it wasn't maybe there was elements of it that came in later on okay this actually started as morning demonstrations Hu Yaobang was the secretary general of the Chinese Communist Party from 1982 to 87 and he was a reformer more so than Deng Xiaoping okay very much a reformer a reformer that would agitate and upset many of the leaders in the Chinese government but nobody could touch him because he was one of the originals that was one with Mao from the very beginning okay but he said that we should wear Western suits and we should, you know, speak openly, blah, blah, blah. And he had a large following among the young people. Okay. I think he was, I think he was a physics professor. He dies. They force him out of his position. And two years later, he dies of a heart attack. And this, this, this theory starts to creep up that somehow, you know, the government was behind this. They, they broke his heart by forcing him out of that position and the man withered away and died and there's this indirect blame on on the party for doing this and what starts as not just in beijing by the way and by the way tiananmen square is the largest open air plaza on the planet if you look well in that picture there you see the statue of liber uh, the, the statue of freedom right across the street where you see that picture of mao in the portrait is the forbidden city Tiananmen Square is right across from the Forbidden City. That's where you get the headquarters of the Chinese Communist Party is there. The mausoleum of Mao Zedong is there. Okay? The most important offices, okay, 
this is why it was important. It's, it's, like, it's like the Chinese version of the National Mall. All around the square, you have the most important buildings of the Chinese government. Okay? And there were demonstrations in several cities, not just in Beijing. But they grow and grow and grow. April, May, take on more topics, take on a greater character, go from being demonstrations of mourning to demands for reform. Are they calling for the end of Chinese communism? I'll be hesitant to say so. Since the students had a tendency of breaking out in song, and the song they tended to sing was the Internationale, okay? which by no ways is a pro-capitalist song. Okay? And many of the grievances those students had was because of the reforms, and that it was obvious that some people were becoming very, very wealthy and abusing that wealth, party members included, the children of the party members included, and leaving everybody else behind. This was looking bad for China. Um, at first, they tried to placate the demonstrators, but the demonstrators wouldn't leave away, go away, and more kept coming, and more kept coming, and more kept coming. And then Deng Xiaoping moved to make um, a very controversial decision. Okay? Um, but the only way out to get those people off of Tiananmen Square is was um, violence. And this is controversial to today. In China, behind the Great Firewall of China, you can't even look this up. Um, in the, the news media, pro-democracy demonstrators. Yes, they were pro-democracy demonstrators, pro-reformers. The Tiananmen Square massacre on June 4th, after two weeks of martial law, and they kept coming to Tiananmen Square. Um, and by then, the big crowds are gone. 300,000 troops were sent into the heart of Beijing and, and violently crushed whatever demonstrators were there. And, well, the world, the Western world, interpret this as, okay, there you go. You know, that the typical brutality that we could expect from ty that type of a government, and it was, it was it was a really bad move on behalf of, of the Chinese authorities. Um, if, if they were trying to um, woo the West, this was going to set things back incredibly so, and hundreds of people were just steamrolled. Um, and that answers the question, you know, when you send troops against your own people, are your troops going to do what the government said, or are your troops going to side with the people? Well, in the case of China... They sided with the government. So let's do something crazy. Let's jump to the Eastern Bloc. Mister, that makes no sense. Oh, it's going to make perfect sense. All of these dots connect. Just like the Pope in Solidarity. All of these, absolutely, mentioning what happened in China in early 89 connects. So once again... Germany, Poland, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Romania, Bulgaria, all members of the Warsaw Pact. We're back in Poland. Years after Solidarity was banned, new people in the Polish government decide to lift martial law and decide what the heck Let's negotiate with solidarity, and solidarity comes back up. Okay. This would not have happened without Gorbachev's election. Well, indirect election. He was elected by the Supreme Soviet. That's the way it works there. You didn't. Uh, people didn't directly elect the president. People through the various levels of government elect the members of the Supreme Soviet. The Supreme Soviet elects the premiership. And the premiership elects the <clears throat> the chair. Um, <clears throat> so, if it wasn't for Gorbachev, these things would not happen because Gorbachev at home was opening the door to reform. And the Poles said, if the Russians are doing it, that means they will not do anything to us, like Czechoslovakia and Hungary years earlier, if we open up to reform. Then let's take that gamble. And that's what the Polish government does. 
not only legit, you know, legalizes solid, solidarity and, and negotiates with them, but they begin talks um, that take place throughout June about relaxing the hold of the Polish Communist Party and allowing free multi-party elections um, by mid-year. Next door, in Hungary, the changes start reverberating. Janusz Kanar, longtime uh, president of Hungary, steps down. There's an ongoing economic crisis. What's going on in Poland next door encouraged many Hungarians to do what they had never done before, which was take to the streets and demonstrate against the government asking for reforms. Now, let me say something about Hungary. Not all Marxist-Leninist governments performed at the same level. Through no shortage of indexes, if you had to choose in the Eastern Bloc where to live, you were better off living in Eastern Germany and Hungary than the rest of the, of the Eastern Bloc. These were the top performers. Nowhere near the West, of course, but the top economic performers in the Eastern Bloc. Hungary's currency was the only currency that you could actually exchange with Western currencies outside of Hungary. That's how stable their currency was compared to the ruble. You couldn't take it outside of, uh, out of Russia, out of the Soviet Union. So now it starts in Poland, spreads to Hungary. And now the Hungarian government enters into talks with reformers, just like it's happening in Poland. Why are they doing it now and they didn't do it before? Well, look at Gorbachev. He seems to be open to reform. If we start to consider reform, chances he's going to come at tanks with us, well, we're going to take our chance. Probably not. Now, understand, travel in these places is very restricted. Okay? If, if you were a citizen of the Soviet Union, okay, Travel outside to the West, forget it. That's not going to happen because they know you're going to leave. But you were free to travel inside the Eastern Bloc. You were free to travel to Germany and study in Czechoslovakia. In fact, that applied to the entire socialist world. Cubans, Nicaraguans, Chinese, Vietnamese. You could travel inside allied countries. The Eastern Germans, you know, a, a bunch of Vietnamese went to East Germany to, to work and live. They have a Vietnamese community. Um, <clears throat> so there was travel, and it was very common for Germans to take vacation, Eastern Germans from Democratic Republic of Germany, to take vacations in Hungary. Okay, that was a very common thing. There was a lot. Of, um, Hungary decides it's the first one that they're going to remove their border fence between Hungary and Austria. That was a bold move, probably the boldest so far. That they're no longer going to patrol the border between Hungary and Austria. If Austria doesn't want Hungarians coming over, let Austria handle it. What happens? Thousands of East Germans, many of them already vacationing, okay, in Hungary, decide to travel to Austria. So you have thousands of East Germans start leaving East Germany, driving through Czechoslovakia into Hungary for the sole purpose of drive, why are they going to Austria? Because they speak German. If they're going to start a new life, yeah, I'd start it in Austria. And now the Austrians are like, what the heck? Now there's a flow of East Germans coming into Austria because Hungary decided they're not going to patrol their border anymore. And so the GDR has to do something that it never did before with a fellow socialist country. It closed its border with Czechoslovakia in 1989. Think of all the effort that has, uh, East Germany has made since the early 60s, to stem the flow of people leaving Germany. And now they're just driving in their trabbies. Um, okay, then you're not going to go to Hungary. You're not going to go to Czechoslovakia either. So East Germany closes the border. So now, this is, um, this is where the drama is going to play out. In the, Democratic German, in the German Democratic Republic. Okay, the place that the world knows as you know, where the 
where the Berlin Wall went up. Okay? Um, this is where most of the drama, the, the real beginning of the end, is going to start to play out. And we've talked about the wall, right? How the wall divided Berlin east and west. So I guess it's this opportunity. A lot of people like to, like, uh, so, so Reagan scared the Soviet Union into collapsing. What a bunch of nonsense. The Soviet Union was, was dealing with economic and political issues for years. Okay? I wouldn't, you know, oh, because Reagan went on June 12th and, and gave a speech in, in front of a bunch of um, important people in suits and said, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. And Gorbachev just couldn't help it after that. Nonsense. Nonsense. Now, I, I want you to picture this. You see that picture of Reagan? He's standing behind Brandenburg Gate. That's the, probably the most central location of all of Berlin. On the top of, Valk uh, uh, of Brandenburg Gate, there's a Valkyrie on a chariot. The back of the Valkyrie is towards Reagan. That means he is facing the western side. He is in West Berlin, where the Reichstag and the Tiergarten is. And behind him is the wall, Brandenburg Gate, and then there's this area with a lot of embassies and what wow. A good week before Reagan was there, David Bowie gave a concert there. I would credit David Bowie more than I would Reagan. Because when Reagan went to speak, maybe some people listened on the other side of the wall. And you can see this on Google, on Google, block, on Google Earth. This is like, oh, I don't know, half a block distance. David Bowie deliberately gave a concert right up against the wall for the deliberate purpose that his concert could be heard on the other side of the wall was only about a half a block away. He deliberately gave that concert for both West Berlin, knowing very well that the people behind him, behind the stage, East Berlin, can listen to that concert as well. And if you're interested, there's a song. B B Bowie lived in Berlin for many years, in West Berlin, and there's a song called Heroes that is about the, great, uh, is about the Berlin Wall. Okay? And he directs it at the guards that are standing there looking over um, as the concert is playing, knowing that there are thousands of East Berliners on the other side of the wall listening to the concert and listening to that song. I would credit Bowie before I would credit Berlin, um, Reagan. Because Bowie, Bowie brought out tens if not hundreds of thousands of East Berliners to his concert. Some people give credit to Bruce Springsteen, the following year, would give a very similar concert to Bowie and draw thousands of people on both sides of the wall. And then, hilarious, David Hasselhoff, former star of Baywatch, but the guy speaks German and sings in German and had like a recording career in Germany. And some people credit him, okay? <clears throat> With these pictures that you see of the, about the Berlin Wall, keep in mind, the graffiti side is the Western side. Because Western West Berliners could go up to the wall and put graffiti. East Berliners can't even touch the wall. So the clean side of the wall, was, so whenever you see these pictures, you always see these pictures where the wall is graffitied. Those are West Berliners. Those are West Berliners they got up on the wall. Those are West Berliners hitting the wall with a mallet, not East Berliners. October 7th, 1989, a couple of months after Reagan's visit and Bowie's visit, and even Springsteen and, and before Hasselhoff, um, the German Democratic Republic celebrates its 40th anniversary. Huge deal, huge parade. Eric Honecker, the current president of East Germany, um, special guests, Mikhail Gorbachev. Um, and so what's the big deal about this? You know, it's not the first time a parade has been given. And of course, 
uh, Gorbachev is a special guest to Honecker. During those ceremonies, Gorbachev basically told them, you need to embrace reforms. And if you don't, and if things get out of hand, don't expect me to come and rescue you. Believe it or not, Gorbachev went and said the same thing to Fidel about the same time. And Fidel was not happy with Gorbachev. Same message to Hanukkah. We're going to change. You're going to change too. And if you don't, don't expect me to come to your rescue. This was a subtle message that things are going to change. East Germany was had no money, was running out of money, was actually borrowing money from West Germany. West Germany only recognized the existence of East Germany years early at the Helsinki um, summit. That visit of Gorbachev, knowing that the most powerful man in the Second World is a reformer and wants his country not only to embrace reform, but basically the Eastern Bloc to embrace, encourages, emboldens people that also want change. Leipzig, and I've been there, at the time it was one of the best medical schools Places you can study medicine um, in the Eastern Bloc, um, city in East Germany, and emboldened by this and by what Gorbachev told Honecker, and somehow it got to the public, they begin to hold large scale protests. This is different. It's not the 50s and it's not the 60s anymore. This is not Prague. This is not Hungary. Now they feel emboldened enough to do this because they feel they're taking the gamble. That unlike Brezhnev and unlike Khrushchev, Gorbachev is not going to come in with tanks rolling. If there was a time to press your government that you want things to change, it's now. Okay? Leipzig has the, 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 the heroic city because that was the first city in all of eastern Germany that begins to rise up and as you can see demonstrates every Monday for the month of October they would take to the streets in the hundreds of thousands and demand changes and you know did they want to uh, did the changes go to the point that they wanted to replace the socialist system to a capitalist one maybe some did maybe some did um, but in the big picture I would say that's like an exaggeration of their claims. And the Lutheran Church had a lot to do with this. Because the first protests, and when I went there, um, this had been going on for years. They've been, you know, and the Stasi was after these people. They would print out these flyers and distribute them, you know, among students and, and dissidents and et cetera, et cetera. So it, it's not a, a surprise that it happened in Leipzig. <clears throat> mounting pressure, these demonstrations, plus Gorbachev, plus the West, Eric Honecker claiming that he was dealing with health issues, steps down and is no longer the president of the German Democratic Republic. Um, that building you see in the corner is interesting. That's um, the Volkshammer. That was the, the Congress, if you will. Of the East German government, um, within years of the East German government falling, they demolished the whole thing, claiming that it was full of asbestos. Egon Krenz becomes the new president of the German Democratic Republic. He's still alive, by the way. It's a very short tenure, kind of spoiler alert. Within weeks of what happened in Leipzig, Leipzig, now Berlin gets it. Okay, Alexander Platz, eh, what I call it, the heart of East Berlin, kind of, sort of, because when you're in Berlin, you always end up in Alexander Platz for some reason. Alexander Platz is where 
the <clears throat> the German Democratic Republic built a huge telephone a television tower. You always look for the television tower. And then they have that clock. That clock is still there. They, you know, it's like a sundial. Like wherever you are, you know what time in the world it is. The first and largest grassroots demonstration in GDR history. Yeah, they had the riots in 50-something, but nothing like this. A million East Berliners pour into Alexanderplatz to demand democratic reforms. Folks, you could walk from Alexanderplatz to the Volkshammer, the seat of the GDR's government. It's a 15-minute walk, max. Okay? It's a 15-minute walk. So, so in the in you know already the heart of Berlin, there's a million demonstrators. Let me give you perspective. That's like having, yeah, that's like the distance. That's absolutely like the distance between the Lincoln Memorial and the White House. A million people poured there. So the GDR doesn't know what to do. Um, they start sending government officials to the demonstrations. We hear you. We understand. We agree with you. Trying to placate the crowd. Again, the crowd doesn't really want an end to the system overall. At least that's not the majority of the voices. Okay? <clears throat> but they do want new people. And they do want elections that are more competitive. The East Germans had this very strange system. It was multi-party, but it wasn't. It had the facade of a multi-party system. November 9th, 1989, a, and so this is, this is the crazy part. In order to, and, and many of these Germans, one of the things they're asking, they'd like to see family members unrestricted that are on the other side of the wall. Okay. Egon Kranz speaks to the government. He's the head of government. Uh, number one, they decided to reopen the border with Czechoslovakia. You could travel back to Czechoslovakia. I know what you're going to do. You're going to go all the way to Austria. Then they said, the government said, and we're going to start taking steps into relaxing travel restrictions, okay, into West Germany. People heard that, and in their minds, they took it much further. They interpreted it as, hey, they're going to get rid of the travel. No, 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 no. We're going to take steps, start relaxing the travel restrictions. Before you know it, you got millions of people lined up against the wall thinking and understanding. Oh, no, they said they're going to get rid of the travel restrictions. Okay? And when it came, to, now you have a bunch of people up against the wall waiting to be let through the various checkpoints saying that they claim they heard on TV that Kranz was going to, you know, allow people to travel to the West. And in one of the entry points, the guy said, okay, I guess, and opens up the checkpoint. That was not the intent, but that's what it became. And on November 9th, there was, by, by de facto, by misinterpretation, the restriction was lifted, and you start seeing East Berliners pour into West Berlin and West Berliners welcome. See that picture you see there? Okay? Again, that's the West Berlin side. That's the graffiti side. They have the back of the Valkyrie towards us in the picture. The other side of that picture where the buildings are, that's the east side. That's another picture of West Berlin. Because the Valkyrie is not facing us. From that point forward, um, they started talking. Uh, we're talking about a year. A year of negotiations. How to unite Germany. And this is still controversial till today. Because the idea was, to many of them felt the idea was they were going to merge these two systems together. It's very complicated. All right, what do you what do you do with um, you know career government workers 
from the socialist side. They had pensions. They had uh, professors. You had people that had, uh, you know, tenure. What do you do with these people? Okay, how do you integrate them? How, how do you, what do you do with the East German mark? How do you integrate that into the German mark? It's very complicated business. At first, they believed there was going to be a merging of sorts. But the way they write the treaty, the government of the German Democratic Republic will cease to exist and ascend to the Federal German Republic. That's what happens. It's a very bumpy road into many. It, it was never quite resolved the way a lot of people imagined. I mean, some of the poorest parts of Germany till this day are still what was once Eastern Germany. Um, <clears throat> but October 3rd, 1990, it's celebrated as German Reunification Day. Um, it's not the, si the day that both sides came together. It's the side, it's the, you know, and they really they had no money to resist. It's, it's the day that the German Democratic Republic ceased to exist and acquiesced. Um, the West moved its capital to Berlin and then went and arrested Egon Krutz and several of the top people in the East German government. And they served multi-year sentences. They fought them in court and then went after ex-Stasi members. So I'm going to put on the links things that I want you to watch. 1990, um, yeah, Germany in October, but already the ball had been rolling. The Baltic states, in 1990, Lithuania held democratic elections. And their newly democratic parliament declared independence from the USSR on the, first, on the 11th of March, 1990. This would not be finalized until 1991. And of course, the Soviets were not happy about this. Latvia is going to follow May 4th. Estonia is going to be following May 8th. We go from 15 republics to 12. Understanding what direction this is heading to. Trying as hard as he can to keep the other 12 together. A referendum is put before the citizens of the Soviet Union. And this was something that was hotly debated in the Central Committee. But a proposition was put before the Soviet people. 80% of the Soviet citizens went to vote, despite the fact that five of the 12 remaining republics actually boycotted this referendum. The question was, do you consider necessary the preservation of the, Soviet of so the, the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics as a renewed federation of equal sovereign republics in which the rights and freedoms of an individual or any ethnicity will be fully guaranteed. And the socialist character, whether you want to keep it or not, was inherent in the question, the union of Soviet socialist republics. 80% of the people said, yes, we want to keep it. 80% turnout, 80% of the people said, yes. So they had that on paper, but would it be enough? What most Soviets wanted to do was to reform, but not completely trash it and start again. August 1991. Now, let's think about this. Poland has gone her own way, held elections. Communists lost. Hungary, the same thing. Germany, the same thing. The Baltic states have left. The great you know, Soviet Union and its Eastern Bloc has disintegrated, no longer exists. The only thing there is the Soviet Union without the, without the, the Baltic states. The Czechoslovakia, same thing. In fact, they divorced, they split in two. Czech Republic and the Slovak Republic. Um, conservatives that were still in the government had enough with Gorbachev's uh, reforms. You know, and I, I, I didn't want to tinker into causes. But one of the causes that we have to consider, OK, 
okay? Is that by this point, you already had a good number of pro-West reformers in the upper echelons of government. It may be considered that that wasn't an accident. Okay? That one of the reasons for the fall of the Soviet Union, I don't want to use the word traitors, Trojan horses were strategically placed inside the Soviet government. Okay? I would say Gorbachev was one. But from somebody on the outside, that's kind of like a little callous. I mean, he, he claims he wants, you know, to this day, to this day, he claims this is not what he wanted. The hardliners had enough of Gorbachev, saw what had happened, did not want to lose any more, and basically decide to pull a coup. They form a ruling committee themselves. They appointed themselves as the new ruling committee and declared a state of emergency. Gorbachev's vice president, Yanayev, in the state of emergency, declares himself the new president of the Soviet Union since he's vice president and orders the arrest of Gorbachev. I remember the, the day on the news, the day this played out. Incredible confusion. Tanks begin to surround Red Square and the Russian Parliament Building. Understand, the Russian Parliament Building is not the Kremlin. The Kremlin is the seat of government for the Soviet Union. The Russian Parliament Building, think of that as the state legislature, the building, for Russia, the Russian Soviet Socialist Republic. Okay? Just like we have governors there, they have governors there too, but they were not called governors. Was, so, Gorbachev was the president of the Soviet Union. That's like saying the president of the United States. Boris Yeltsin was the president of the Russian Soviet Socialist Republic. So, that would be the equivalent of a governor here in the United States. Tanks begin to surround the Russian parliament building. They start to build barricades around that building. Okay? And refuse to let the tank and the army in. And Boris Yeltsin, speaking as president of the Russian Soviet Socialist Republic, condemns the hardliners, condemns the coup, asks for the release of, um, of Gorbachev, and calls for a general strike. By the 21st, tanks unable to breach the barricades. Some of the soldiers actually start to defect. This is very different than China. Since now you release the troops, what are the troops going to do? Are they going to turn on the people? Or are they going to start siding on the people? There is some fighting, but this is pretty much a bloodless situation. There is some fighting in and around Moscow. Okay, But what starts to happen in Russia did not happen in China. Troops start to defect over on the other side to and around Boris Yeltsin. Um, <clears throat> the Russian parliament, which is not the, uh, the Soviet uh, legislature, the Russian parliament gave its support to Yeltsin and Yeltsin orders the arrest of the coup leaders. So that coup didn't last very long. As the coup leaders try to flee to Crimea, the Supreme Soviet abolishes um, their committee and restores Gorbachev as president of the Soviet Union. So the, the Supreme Soviet orders the abolishment of that ruling committee by the, by, by the coup leaders and orders the restoration of Gorbachev. And the couple of weeks between the failed coup and what happens on Christmas Day in 1991 um, are just the last gasps of the once Soviet Union. Um, I, I guess realizing that the situation was unsalvageable 
and really buying into the notion that, you know, even more so than here at home, that, you know, if we just embrace free market economics, things are going to be better for everyone. No, no, it's going to be a nightmare. It's going to be a nightmare for the next 10 years for most ordinary um, Russians. Um, but that's editorializing. December 25th, 1991, Gorbachev resigns as president of the Soviet Union and hands over all of his power to Russian President Boris Yeltsin. The following day, the Supreme Soviet recognized the independence of the, Soviet, of the former Soviet republics and formally dissolves, and in doing so, dissolves the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. And on that day, the Soviet flag is brought is, is, is taken down and never flown again from the top of the Kremlin. So the next slide is, is going to show you uh, the sequence of events, the sequence of events. I tried to keep away from the causes. Okay. Um, yeah. I might not have been 100% uh, you know, keep it to my word there, but I tried to keep it just a sequence of events, um, and this is what led to the end of the Soviet Union. And so here's just um, how it plays out. 